Hi, and welcome to our listeners worldwide. I am Dorit Oren, Director of Product Marketing at Gilad Satellite Networks. As many of you know, Gilad is a leading global provider of products and services for satellite-based broadband communications. Gilad has been in this business for almost 30 years now, and we specialize in fixed and on-the-move communications for both commercial and government entities. Gilad is a strong player in the consumer broadband market with many installations worldwide. For example, I am pleased to share that recently SES and Gilat were selected by Facebook to provide internet connectivity across sub-Saharan Africa. This solution includes Gilat's X architecture platform that will enable Facebook's local African partners to deliver internet services to underserved and unconnected communities. In today's webinar, we will focus on the untapped market of home broadband in underserved areas. I assume that for you, our listeners today, and for most of the people you know, internet to the home is a given. However, about half the world is still not adequately connected and does not enjoy the social, political, and economic advantage of the internet. I'd like to suggest that you stay tuned to hear about an alternative to the current solutions for bridging the digital divide. In this webinar today, I'm pleased to be hosting Jose del Rosario, Research Director Manila, who is with Northern Sky Research, known also as NSR. NSR is a global market research company focusing on the analysis and growth in areas such as satellite communications. Before we get started, please bear with me for a few procedural issues. If you would like to ask questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box. We will take as many questions as time permits at the end of the presentation. If there are questions that we don't get to during this session, we will get back to you directly. In addition, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on Gilad's website. Let's now go over the agenda of today's webinar. First, Mr. Jose del Rosario will review findings on the digital divide and then we'll discuss the broadband market and how new opportunities can be created. I will then look deeper into the broadband market and we'll discuss the pros and cons of the common solutions focusing on the underserved areas in the emerging markets. And since the terminal price is a key market inhibitor, I will address it as part of this webinar. I will also define the target market for which we propose a new innovative solution, which takes the best of both the cellular world and the satellite world. I will then proceed to explain the hybrid solution that SES and Gilat are bringing to market, covering the end user perspective and going through the value proposition for the DTH and MNO stakeholders. We will then take some questions and I'll finalize with a summary. So now, allow me to present Jose del Rosario, NSR's Research Director. Please go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Oren. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening uh, to our audience, depending on where you are in the globe today. Um, so looking at the digital divide, it really is uh, a challenging uh, conundrum, but it also, in our view, is an opportunity um, for um, satellite manufacturers, satellite operators, and the whole satellite industry in terms of tapping into this value chain. Uh, next slide, please. When we speak of the digital divide, um, the challenges are paramount, and when it's debated or discussed, most of the discussion centers on the challenges that appear on the left of your screen. And these are serious challenges, starting with uh, the low disposable income levels in areas where the digital divide persists. These are rural areas, underserved areas, poor populations, poor countries. 
and that translates directly to low ARPU levels on the end user base, which then makes it difficult for mobile operators to justify ROI in terms of investing in these said areas. It translates further to high uh, capital expenditure and operational expenditure. So once again, when there is consideration in investing in areas where the digital divide persists, there are many elements that come into that, but paramount is the cost structure, which translates to the ARPU levels and investment dollars or whatever currency that happens to be in given markets. Being a consulting company, however, um, <clears throat> the flip side to challenges are actually opportunities which appear on the right side of your screen. We believe that there is a large untapped market um, in the globe, which number in the billions. Um, and since there is no uh, service or even basic MSS internet access or even mobile access in areas where the digital divide, digital divide persists, not only do you offer or gain one or two, you can even gain three revenue streams because from nothing you can have basic voice and SMS services to internet access to even video streaming. Third, we believe that because there is no uh, adequate market players in digital divide areas, it's a greenfield market where there's limited competition, at least for now. And once again, looking at all the factors that add up to the opportunities, we believe that it opens up other service offerings or application suites. So if you have nothing and over time, the application suites in urban areas begin to um, justify traffic for high bandwidth on 4G or even 5G, a digitally modified area with not even 1G or 2G again opens up opportunities for a lot of service offerings. Next challenge, uh, next slide please. So having outlined the challenges and opportunities, where exactly is the digital divide? Well, according to the ITU, based on this graphic, it's everywhere. And that translates to a 4.4 billion market in poor, developing, emerging, and developed country markets. Globally, the market is about 60% of the global population. Um, the most prevalent is in Africa, where close to 80% of the population do not uh, have access or use the internet as of the end of 2015. The most um, connected, so to speak, is in Europe with 77.6%, but that still translates to over 20% of an addressable market. All around it's mixed, um, Asia Pacific with 37%, Arab states at 37% as well, CIS at 60%, and even the Americas, uh, North America and uh, Canada, um, there's close to uh, 34% or 35% of uh, the populations there not being addressed. On the next slide, we then see that um, the digital divide can really be quickly bridged by wireless technology. But then we have to look at the evolution of the so-called G. Um, we're past 1G. Uh, most rural areas are on 2G and, and organizing to 4G. There's talk right now of doing the definitions and the technical attributes for 5G and it's coming in about four years. So basically the digital divide persists because the G has not evolved significantly to the unserved po population of the globe, which once again numbers over 4 billion. 2G networks persist today and will likely to persist over the long term. And once again, this is a major issue for the wireless industry. But as the satellite industry begins to address this, we see this as a tremendous opportunity. Next slide, please. Uh, Cisco, when looking at market trends, has tracked the market uh, from 2014 to present and has forecasted, forecasted forward what the world will be like uh, in the year 2019. The graph on top uh, presents the numbers of devices or connections and basically 2G and 3G connections um, are uh, dominant today and will con continue to be dominated in 2019 by 2G and 3G connections. 
When we look at the bottom graph, however, traffic is dominated and will be dominated by 4G. So there's an inverse relationship between devices and traffic. Devices dominated once again by slow 2G, 3G devices, whereas traffic would be dominated by 4G um, video streaming and other applications that support that. The satellite industry today, for the most part, is supporting 2G connections, but is making inroads in 3G and, to some extent, 4G. This is in the wireless backhaul world. So in areas where the digital divide persists, this, the satellite industry is at play, but it's still largely a 2G and 3G proposition. Basically, what the lesson from Cisco, or what Cisco is saying to our industry and everywhere, is that for the opportunity in the digital divide to be um, tapped, the uh, developments in the satellite industry should be in step with developments in the wireless terrestrial world of 4G and even 5G by 2019. Next slide, please. So where are the market uh, opportunities for the satellite industry? In bridging the digital divide, uh, the obvious one, of course, is broadband access, but we believe that there's a, an opportunity as well for DTH. Uh, next slide, please. For broadband access, it's really broadband affordability that's been the key issue. And this graph uh, by the ITU says that the case for universal satellite broadband or bridging the digital divide are in many areas of the globe, and the key challenge is, is cost in making broadband services affordable. I won't go through the map, but the concentration of where affordability is a big issue is really in the African region. Broadband is being touted now as a universal right, and um, as uh, Ms. Oren has pointed out, um, they have an initiative in sub-Saharan Africa with Facebook, and um, you know it's already beginning to take shape. The digital divide has been an issue since the 1990s, and we're almost 30 years down the road and the affordability issue is still not being addressed adequately. Next slide, please. So in our own research, we then look at um, where broadband access subscribers and revenues are going. When we look at the market in 2013 and where we believe that's going in 10 years, broadband access subscribers will have a net addition of about 4.5 million within a 10-year period. Global HTS system will cause some shakeup this year and continuing until next year, but it's a good shakeup because with HTS coming in, the cost structure on the space segment at least will be addressed. We note here that Latin America will have the most significant percentage in rise in additions, and in terms of revenues on the bottom graph, the same uh, trends apply to Latin America where the rise in additions from 1% will increase to about 9% by 2023. Service revenues globally will increase from 1.5 billion to 5.2 billion, or more than a three-fold increase. And since we're looking at the globe um, in terms of digital divide programs, China is expected to be a key market as well. But looking at the graphs um, and looking where the backdrop of the digital divide is, it does represent a healthy market for the satellite industry based on current market conditions. However, we note that 4.5 million new subscribers within a 10-year period is a very small fraction of the addressable 4.4 billion total market potential. Next slide, please. So we then look at funding. When we talk about uh, digital divide, there's really two basic uh, funding sources, which is government and private, and we also look at the uh, geographic mix. Looking at the top graph, in 2013, about 11% of subscribers were considered urban, 20 were single areas. So again, the digital divide is, is persisting in rural areas, and this is the sweet spot, so to speak, for um, the satellite industry. By 2023, we expect growth to be in favor, of, or in favor of urban and suburban areas, but the net ads will still favor rural, the rural markets. So again, the satellite sweet spot will remain in rural areas, but there are increasing opportunities in suburban as well as urban areas. Looking at the funding source, um, private funding will sustain long-term developments. Basically, you need affordable pricing and affordable packages 
to enable uh, a satellite connection and a satellite internet service. Government funding, we recognize, is a much needed shot in the arm. And again, when we look at programs in Latin America, Brazil's SGDC program is meant to bridge a digital divide in that large country. But again, when we look at the uh, where the market is headed and where we believe the digital divide will, will be bridged, government spending will only account for less than 10% of the subscriber base. It's really uh, uh, government, uh, sorry, corporate and commercial funding that will be the key to bridging the digital divide. Next slide, please. When we compare the two, um, the top slide gives the number of subscribers that are being enabled by government funding. Um, the curve will begin to flatten out uh, in the year 2020, and this is because the programs that are really driving government spending are Australia's NBN, uh, initiatives in North America, and the European Union. We note, however, that these are developed country markets, developed regions, so the digital divide is being bridged in those developed countries. To sustain growth, people need to pay for their own broadband services and not expect it as a subsidy, and we, when we apply that to developing and poor countries, it's really a difficult proposition to address. When we look at fun private funding on the lower graph, um, the curve is a little bit more dynamic. It's steady growth. Um, it's not flattening out. It's continuing, and if we imagine this time period extending to 2030, that graph will continue to go upwards. The other comparative is the scale of the market. When we look at the top graph, the number of subscribers being enabled by government um, is about 300,000 by the year 2023. When we compare that with private funding or private spending, the level is at 7 million by the same time frame. So it's really uh, a no contest, so to speak. And once again, the game change can only take place when cost structures decline in poor and developing country markets, where a widening of the divide is increasing annually. Next slide, please. So that, that was the opportunity for broadband access. We believe, however, that there's an opportunity in terms of leveraging uh, the DTH market. So some statistics again from Northern Sky Research. Um, by 2023, over 300 million new TV households will be present in the globe. The global DTH penetration level is expected to increase from 16% in 2013 to 22% by 2023. So beyond 2023, if we imagine that the uh, time frame will extend to 2030 and beyond, DTH penetration levels will increase, so basically there will be a higher number of satellite dishes on top of rooftops, and this is the market that we believe can be leveraged to address the digital divide in terms of market opportunity. Next slide, please. In terms of the actual market numbers, this market represents 136 million new subscribers globally by 2023. Um, if we notice on the graph, the majority of subscribers are basic, which is really reflective of a, of a low ARPU level. Developed country markets are maturing, they have high ARPU levels, but it's not also persistent as a digital divide market, so to speak. So when we look at the majority of subscribers which are basic and growing in poor and developing countries, cost structures once again are key. So in bundling internet access with DTH services, a package that is attractive in, in terms of cost and in terms of um, equipment and service have to, take in, have to be taken into account. Next slide, please. So here's the global uh, snapshot within a 10-year period, and I won't uh, touch on each and every region. But when we look at the Americas, um, North America accounts for one quarter of the revenue growth to 2023. That's quite high. Um, given the high value and given the high ARPU levels that the North American market brings. But when you look at South America, it's a perfect storm, so to speak, in terms of market dynamics. There is rising ARPU levels and there's also rising sub-numbers. So basically, when we look at the model of volume opportunities, the model has been lower your cost structure and it will lead to higher growth. That's true and that's applicable to South America. 
But South America is a little bit unique because even with rising ARPU levels, there is also an attributable rising sub numbers. It's just the nature of the media and TV markets there. So for emerging economies, lower cost structures will definitely help. For the Americas like South America, it would help as well. But for other regions like Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the ARPU levels have to decline in order to jumpstart the market there. Next slide, please. So basically, after looking at the dynamics, the challenges, the opportunities in looking at the digital divide, it's really a price elasticity question. In our view, how do we begin to bridge a digital divide? Well, one way is to lower the CPE cost. And basically, if we improve the cost structure, that equates to a stimulation of demand, and it's a virtual circle. When we look at the, um, the uh, bars on, on the left side, Low disposable incomes will be addressed by lower cost structures, which will lead to sustainable ARPUs, which will then lead to broadband penetration because uh, wireless, the wireless industry and the DTH industry will invest in those um, poor and emerging areas. When that happens, household incomes will improve. There was a study by McKinsey that, that stated that if the broadband penetration or access is increased by 10% in a given area, that same area automatically increases its GNP by 1%. So over the long term, a single change in the ecosystem, such as lower price costs in equipment, can jumpstart service procurement and increase the demand levels. So basically, we believe that uh, bandwidth demand and internet access services is price elastic. The graph on the right is a typical uh, price elasticity curve used by economists. Basically, it says that when you increase the price by 33%, your contracts decline by 50%. But conversely, if you decrease the price by 33%, your contracts will increase by 50%. The question is, is internet access a price elastic uh, commodity or service? We haven't done the study. Uh, we are prepared to do that, but in our view, it might not be a 33%, 50% market dynamic or market equation, but certainly when you decrease the price, you do stimulate demand. And with that, I turn it back to Ms. Oren, and uh, I'll be happy to take some questions at the end of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Del Rosario, for a most interesting market review. Mr. Del Rosario will be staying with us until the end of the webinar, at which point we will both take questions from the audience. Now let's examine further the exciting opportunity of delivering broadband to the home for underserved markets. I'd like to first review the connectivity solutions that are currently available. On slide 18, on the right, we see a chart from the World Bank and other sources that shows clearly that the internet remains unavailable, inaccessible, and unaffordable for the majority of the world's population. It may be hard to believe, but less than half of the world's population has the privilege to access the Internet. While the connected world is composed primarily of homes in urban areas where solutions such as fiber, DSL, and cable modem are prevalent, the majority of unconnected homes are in the emerging markets without terrestrial connectivity. The two commonly known solutions available for populations in rural regions are cellular and satellite. Let's look briefly at the pros and cons of each. Cellular is a common solution used for broadband to the home in unconnected areas. Have a look at the schematic diagram at the top of this slide, slide 19. The ubiquitous cellular network coverage gives an obvious advantage. If you look on the left, the same chart for population coverage that we looked at before, you can see that mobile coverage reaches almost all of the world's population, about 7.4 billion people. Cellular coverage is indeed ubiquitous. But make no mistake, despite this fact that every second person who has cellular connectivity 
does not enjoy broadband. On the other hand, looking at the cons of the cellular solution to the home, we see inadequate performance. Look at the analysis in the chart from Ericsson based on UCLA's speed test data. We can see that in Colombia and Mexico, the median downlink, downlink speed is as low as around 3 megabits per second. And looking further in Argentina and Brazil, it's even lower, not even 1 megabits per second which is a clear example, of course, of the underserved cellular market. So the point here is that even though the cellular coverage is ubiquitous, it is not able to provide the required broadband speeds. The other example is satellite connectivity for broadband access. When terrestrial coverage is not an option, satellite is really the only solution. Look at the schematic diagram on slide 20, which shows the VSAT in the home for broadband connectivity over satellite. Here we see an advantage of delivering high-performance broadband to the home with very quick deployment and which is possible almost anywhere on the globe. This is an excellent solution. However, for some regions, and I want to stress some regions of the emerging markets, the cost of the terminal or VSAT is simply too high. So is there a way to get the best of both worlds? What if we could take advantage of the ubiquitous cellular coverage while simultaneously enjoying the satellite capacity to provide fast download performance, and of course, without paying a high price for the terminal. Before we continue, let's take a minute and see if it's really about the cost. Is cost really the inhibitor to expanding broadband penetration? Clearly, in the emerging markets, there is a high sensitivity to cost of the customer premise equipment and installation expenses. These regions are often cash-based economies where business is done in a prepaid model. This is contrary to the business model where the VSAT cost may be part of the monthly payments. The prepaid model in these regions, unfortunately, does not support the end user spending hundreds of dollars in a one-time payment. In these areas, the terminal subsidy is simply not an option. I also want to point out the survey on the right of this slide, slide 23. It further supports cost sensitivity and shows that the cost of broadband service is the major reason for why people are not connected. Further stressing this point, I want to share with you that at Gilat, we conducted research to establish the price elasticity of the terminal on broadband penetration. We have found this to be true in the emerging markets, as you can see on the chart. Let me walk you through the chart. The blue represents the terminal cost at X dollars, and the green represents X over $2, in other words, half the terminal cost. Look at areas like Latin America, Eastern Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. The green bar in those regions is more than double the blue bar. In these areas, we can clearly see that the predicted fast growth of the subscriber base is strongly influenced by a very significant cost reduction of the terminal. Now let's examine the innovative solution for bridging the digital divide by first defining the target market. On slide 26, 
The circles represent the three criteria required for defining the hybrid market. On the left, in blue, is the rural market, where terrestrial connectivity is not available. In red, on the right, is the underserved market, where cellular connectivity exists but is weak. This happens a lot in developing countries, but not only. And in yellow on the bottom is the emerging market or developing market, where two-way satellite broadband connectivity is just too expensive. In other words, the current cost of terminals and installation are simply not feasible in the developing market. So the convergence of these three markets is a fantastic fit for the affordable hybrid terminal. So as I have mentioned, the hybrid terminal takes the best of the cellular world and the best of the satellite world. And how does it work? Well, it capitalizes on the asymmetrical nature of home usage data traffic, where the ratio of download to upload is about 15 to 1, or between 10 and 20, but we say around 15 to 1. This is the essence of why we can achieve excellent user experience with a hybrid solution. Since consumers download from the internet much more than they upload, a clever and effective solution is to use powerful satellite capacity for high-speed downloads and the existing terrestrial connection for upload traffic. We see that a hybrid broadband terminal can do an excellent job at a much lower cost than a two-way full VSAT. SES and Gilat recently announced a partnership on a hybrid broadband solution to bring broadband service to the underserved regions worldwide. This solution uses Gilat's SkyEdge 2C Libra terminal and SES's satellite. In the press release here that you see in front of you that we issued at Communication in May, Mr. Ferdinand Kaiser, Chief Commercial Officer from SES, expressed his belief that the hybrid approach represents a huge opportunity. I'll read his quote. DTH providers will be able to use their existing satellite infrastructure and distribution channels to offer triple play services to improve customer loyalty and reduce churn. In addition, MNOs can offer the hybrid broadband service, leveraging their cellular networks, and boost them with more capacity, thus significantly improving broadband penetration to underserved areas. I want to clarify, if it's not obvious, that the announcement refers to SES 9 for Asia Pacific. However, SES will be launching SES 10 in Q4 this year to enable hybrid broadband for Latin America as well. Now I would like to explain how the solution works. See first an illustration of the satellite network for the download direction. The SS capacity can be used for both DTH and IP broadband. And the SES teleport includes Gilad Skyge to C Hub, which is used for fast data download over the satellite link. The home one-way antenna that you see here on the roof, or also often known as the dish, is used for receive only for both TV and broadband. Take note that only the download direction is supported via the satellite, and it provides up to 20 megabits per second. And now on the next slide, we see an illustration of the other direction, the terrestrial network, from the home to the Internet. This is done via either the cellular network or DSL. And this connection is used only for the upload direction. I want to point out that the much lighter upload traffic can suffice with slower speeds, which are more than appropriate for the home user usage patterns. And now, putting both of these sides together on slide 31, 
we see an illustration of the full service. Broadband download via satellite and upload via the terrestrial connection. Take a minute to look inside the home. We can see the Gilat Libra terminal providing broadband access to the home computer with download data provided via the satellite link and using the same receive-only dish that is used for TV reception. The upload to the internet is done via a dongle, often called also a cellular USB modem, that connects to the Libra terminal. This cellular dongle transmits to the terrestrial network for the upload direction. As you can see, the upload data is received at Gilat's Sky2C hub and is delivered to the internet. Let's now focus on the value of this solution to the various stakeholders. We'll first look at what's in it for the end user and then discuss the value for the DTH providers and the MNOs. From the end user perspective, a low-cost terminal for home broadband is an exciting proposition. There are really only three required elements for this easy, low-cost install. First, a low-cost receive-only outdoor antenna is needed, and in most cases you can leverage on the existing DTH antenna and LNB. Second, the low-cost indoor hybrid satellite modem, that's Libra from Gilat. And third, all you need is a standard cellular USB dongle, and it needs to be connected to the Libra indoor modem. So you can see that for end users already engaged with DTH, it is easy to expand the service to broadband. Now let's examine what's in it for the DTH providers and the MNOs. They can both leverage their existing infrastructure. Let's take them one at a time. Now on slide 34, you can see the value for the DTH providers. We heard earlier from Jose del Rosario about the substantial growth of the DTH market. The passive receive-only satellite dishes already exist in tens of millions of homes for TV reception, and more subscribers are expected. Really, only minor modifications are needed in order to convert a one-way architecture into a two-way architecture. With the Libra modem, both video and internet can now be received by the same DTH dish. So the DTH providers can leverage the current satellite infrastructure that they use and their own distribution channels in order to also provide broadband. In other words, this solution gives the DTH providers the ability to participate with triple play. Now look at the diagram where the DTH service is running side by side with the additional broadband service. That's the pink and the blue lines you see here from the satellite. Note that the same antenna and LMB can be used for broadband and DTH services from the same orbital position. But alternatively, an additional LMB can be added to support DTH and broadband connectivity from two different orbital positions. And now let's look at the value proposition for the MNOs. MNOs can utilize the current network for upload and offer broadband via satellite at high speeds of 20 megabits per second download without congesting their network. So this is true even in a network with upload traffic at only tens of kilobits per second. So this way, by offering end users a low-cost, high-performance hybrid terminal, the ARPU can be increased and customer loyalty can be sustained. Having the ability to offer reliable broadband enables service providers to both increase customer retention and do this in the underserved areas, as well as increase the broadband penetration in suburban and rural areas. Now, before I summarize, I'd like to take some questions, so please hold on for just a minute.
Okay, first question. Is the performance of the hybrid service sufficient? Okay, sure, yes it is. So as I mentioned, the satellite link for broadband downloads is up to 20 megabits per second. And this is significantly higher than the average that we talked about earlier, as you recall, of 20 megabits per second in the underserved areas. And by the way, I'd like to point out that 20 megabits per second is certified as high-speed broadband in many countries. And let me explain. The hybrid solution is based on the fact that consumers download much more than they upload. So for consumer home usage, the slower cellular or terrestrial speeds are more than sufficient for the upload direction. Just a minute, another question here for NSR. Is the market for rural connectivity diminishing due to increased urbanization in LATAM? mostly in Brazil. Mr. Del Rosario, can you please answer this? Uh, yes, thank you, Ms. Oren. Um, not, not really in our view. Um, urbanization in Latin America, which I believe stands at about 90%, has been going on for years now. And for countries such as Brazil, the thrust to bridge the digital divide has continued, if not increased. And this is epitomized by the program of SGDC. Um, Latin America's population, I believe, stands at about 630 million, which means that about 10% of that is a rural population base of about uh, 63 million. That is still a large subscriber base today and going forward. Increasing economic growth with ICT investments, increasing urbanization is a result of limited opportunities in rural areas. So if the digital divide is bridged and economic growth and opportunities are ushered in, the rate of urbanization will actually decrease as people will choose to stay in their villages instead of migrating to urban centers. So in our view, yes, the increase in urbanization is, um, is always been there and will continue to increase, but you still have a large population base that you can actually help uh, mitigate the rate of urbanization by investing in ICT. And that's where the satellite industry can come in. Thank you. Uh, another question here. Explain the hybrid terminal cost saving. Well, the hybrid terminal uses a passive receive-only antenna. This is a smaller standard antenna, uh, very similar to a DTH antenna or a DTH antenna that does not transmit. It's a one-way antenna, so it doesn't need a buck, and it's easier and fast to install. So it therefore significantly reduces the cost and is much, much lower cost than a two-way VSAT. And here's another one. Uh, when would a hybrid be used instead of a full terrestrial connection? Okay, actually, if a high-speed terrestrial connection is available, then it should be used. However, when the terrestrial connection is poor, then a hybrid solution is advised and is a perfect solution. So bear in mind that the hybrid service provides a much better user experience if you compare to a service for users that are located far from the DSLAM or the cellular base stations, or in situations where those terrestrial networks are simply too congested. Okay, let's take just a couple more. Um, Mr. Del Rosario, please answer this question. How will the current instability in LATAM affect implementation of the digital divide programs? That's a really good question. And there's a lot of concern in the region about um, uh, current financial instability. Well, as, as in any vertical, including enterprise, consumer segments, even GovMill, and uh, many others, um, economic instability will have a negative impact on program spending and implementation. And uh, this, of course, includes uh, digital divide initiatives. But once again, um, this is where the cost becomes highly important. If the program costs are high, implementation will be delayed or canceled outright, depending on the economy's volatility. However, if program costs are low or manageable, chances are programs will continue to proliferate. So, um, I guess the answer to that question is it depends, um, and it depends highly on the program cost, on the terminal cost, and the service cost. The higher the cost, 
the higher the impact, the lower the cost, the greater the chance that the programs will continue. Thank you. And here's a short final question. Uh, is the hybrid solution also available in LATAM or just in Asia? Well, uh, as I said, the solution is interoperable with any SES satellite, including SES-10 for the LATAM region. And we are talking with potential ISPs and DTH operators to launch the solution in selected markets. Now I'd like to summarize uh, in the last slide. I'd like to restate that SES and GILAT see a huge opportunity in the underserved market, and this is supported by research from NSR. The price elasticity model shows that significantly slashing the terminal cost will greatly enhance broadband penetration, specifically in the emerging markets. And this is, of course, where terrestrial service is poor. A hybrid terminal that uses high throughput satellite capacity for the download direction and relies on existing terrestrial connectivity for the upload direction is an affordable proposition. Not only for bridging the digital divide, but also proposes a profitable business case for DTH providers and MNOs, enabling each of them a simple service expansion by leveraging their existing infrastructure. And of course, the end users will enjoy an enhanced broadband experience at an affordable cost. So I'd like to conclude with that and urge you to keep in touch. I would like to thank you, Mr. Jose del Rosario, and of course, thank you all very much for attending. As I mentioned, the webinar is being recorded and will be available shortly on our website. Enjoy the rest of your day. This concludes the webinar. Thank you.